Real Virginia is produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Farming, it's all good. Visit our website at vafarmbureau.org. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all of the wonderful products we enjoy. Virginia's farmers will soon get credit where credit is due on protecting water quality on their farms. Mark Viette has tips for pruning trees as we head into the peak of the growing season and we celebrate Virginia Cooperative Extension and a century of serving Virginians both rural and urban. Welcome back everyone. We're here at a grain and beef farm in Caroline County where the farmer is doing his part for the environment using best management practices. But unfortunately in Virginia, farmers don't get the credit they deserve for these positive environmental steps that they take. That's why a new program has been developed to document and give credit to the farmers for their work in protecting our waterways. Buffer strips, no-till farming, and reducing the use of crop protectant products in the fields. These are all steps many Virginia farmers have been using for decades to keep their land and waterways healthy. But unless they are paid for by cost share funds, farmers had no reliable method of registering these voluntary best management practices, which are seen as a major element of the state's water quality improvement efforts. After two years of development, a resource management plan program will take effect July 1st. The resource management plan is really kind of a different approach than what we've taken in the past. Uh, the main thing is to get farmers to use a high level of conservation practices or best management practices. And what this plan does uh, gives them a new incentive, uh, would basically give them a certainty that uh, during the life of their plan, the implementation of their plan for nine years, they would be assured that they are in compliance with water quality standards uh, associated with uh, Chesapeake Bay and other local uh, cleanup plans. Certified nutrient management and certified resource management plan developers will be available beginning this summer to help farmers interested in the program. It's the first of its kind for any state in the Chesapeake Bay watershed and hopes are high that this program will make a significant difference for Virginia's farmers and the future of the state's waterways. We've got farmers doing nutrient management plans now, doing soil and erosion plans now. Um, what we're simply trying to do is kind of bring it all under one umbrella. Uh, but down the road, what we'd like to have 10 years from now is we'd like to have a, a database that shows widespread adoption of best management practices uh, by our farmers and hopefully uh, 10 years from now our, our waters will reflect their efforts. The new program will not only encourage expanding conservation practices statewide, it will document the practices already in use that could provide verified data to prove the positive impact of the agriculture community's conservation efforts. I think that when we get into this process, we're going to find a number of farmers who are doing 75, 80 percent of everything that they possibly could do, and we're going to help them identify that next 15 or 20 percent um, and, and help come up with a plan to move forward with that um, so that we can, we can look at the environmental community and say we're continuing to make progress, but we can also thank the farmer for his or her efforts and, and again give them some regulatory assurances for the future. Virginia resource management plans will be effective for nine years with compliance inspections every three years. Farmers will enter into a plan agreement on their own. No law will force them to sign up. Uh, at this time, the best way to get information on it is to go to the uh, DCR website. We have information there. We can put you in touch with one of the uh, resource management plan uh, specialists we have on site. All the new plans will be drafted by resource management plan developers, meaning farmers can feel assured that they will be dealing with someone who understands their needs. It's a win-win for farmers and the environment. Nestled between Fredericksburg and Richmond in Central Virginia is Spotsylvania County. Farmers here grow barley, corn, soybeans, hay and wheat on 369 farms covering more than 42,000 acres of land and is a thriving fresh fruit and vegetable industry here. 
Most of the farms in Spotsylvania County are smaller than 179 acres, and most farm operators in the county are part-timers. Altogether, agriculture contributes almost $11 million to the economy of Spotsylvania County, Virginia. Hi, I'm Mark Viet. Coming up on In the Garden, we're going to talk about midsummer pruning, so stay with us. Well, they're on our farm here in Virginia, in Augusta County. We have been here since 1954. We moved here, my dad did. And since then, I've had my two sons and daughter and son-in-law, they're here. I've got grandchildren, so it's a fourth generation here that's on this farm right now. We really feel blessed that all of our family is a part of this farm. They could have chosen different routes. Well, it's a wonderful place to grow up and have a family, and it's, it's, we can all work together and play together. I know there's a lot of families you now that go to work, and you don't see them until that night, whereas with the farm here, we see each other all day long. It's a wonderful place to grow up and live. Being out here in nature and, and watching things grow, and, and just days like today that's a beautiful day, you, you just feel very fortunate. I'm Dan Holsinger. I'm dedicated to dairy my cows, my milk, and my land. Mark Viette joins us now to take us in the garden to show us how to rejuvenate our plants. Here's Mark. As you walk through your garden, you might notice plants like this, plants which have been damaged by woodpeckers, and in this case, this is a viburnum, and the woodpeckers were looking for borers. There's only a couple main trunks left. The rest we've removed. You'll see lots of nice new growth coming up from the base. Midsummer pruning is great for fruit trees, apples, especially pears, because when you do a midsummer pruning, you don't get a lot of new excessive growth. Now I find by walking through the garden in the summer, I'll miss things that normally I would have done the rejuvenation pruning in March, but I find midsummer is an excellent time. And in this case, I would come in and remove these four main trunks and start over and in about three years, I'm gonna have a beautiful viburnum about my height. It's real easy to do. I always recommend that you walk around your tree or shrub three or four times, because once you make the cut, it's done. You can't put it back together again. When you're looking even at your trees, consider cleaning them up, make them look more attractive. And in this case, on the Blue Atlas Cedar, to look at more of these major trunks, I might come in and even remove this small limb right here. Paying attention to the garden really helps reveal lots of things. And one of those things might be dead, dying branches and this is a fringe tree. It's already being pruned and we're removing the dead branches, but I'm looking at it now and I'm seeing a lot of dead branches. At the same time, it's not attractive. There are certain trees that you can come in and cut them back. Now, I, this is not one I would cut back to the ground, but I might go ahead and cut this back to about five feet and let it regrow. But again, study your plants, you do some research online, look at some books to make sure at least what you're gonna do is not gonna kill your plant. On this fringe tree, you can see lots of nice basal growth coming up from the bottom and mid part of this tree. Midsummer pruning helps reduce excessive growth. If I had pruned this early in a year, it would probably have three times as many shoots. This is a branch I cut about a month ago and it looks nice and this will continue to give me the tree. This is one that I'm gonna prune. It's been damaged here on the side and some of the branches up top are dead. So I would come in and prune this always when you're pruning, wear protective eyewear, goggles. Remember branches are very heavy and uh, they can weigh hundreds of pounds. But I would come in, uh, remove this branch here and then again down here lower and let this turn back into, let some of these, and probably this one here will turn into this branch in about three years. 
Wow, it really looks like I damaged this tree, but I can tell you, the original tree will thank me that I pruned it this way. Five years from now, it's gonna look better than ever. Don't be afraid of summer pruning. I'm Mark Viet. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Virginia strawberries are ripe and ready to eat. Carissa Jackson has a recipe for easy strawberry jam in the heart of the home. Do you operate one of these? Then you need one of these. If you operate a motorboat or PWC in Virginia, you need to know about Virginia's boating safety education requirements. Visit the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries website, huntfishva.com, for more details on Virginia's boating requirements or to locate a boating safety course near you. Be responsible, be safe, have fun, and always wear a life jacket on the water. just something perfect about fresh Virginia strawberries, but what if you can enjoy those strawberries all year long? Miss America 2010 Carissa Jackson has a great recipe for easy strawberry jam in the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Carissa Jackson and welcome to Heart of the Home. Today I'll be cooking from the kitchen at Meadow Hall at the Meadow Event Park. Today we're going to be making a fresh strawberry jam that can be frozen or you can use 24 hours after the recipe is made. Strawberries are one of Virginia's favorite pick your own products and you can find them right now at any local farmer's market. They're sweet so this recipe also can be made as a sugar free version for people who are diabetic. But this version we're going to make with a lot of sugar. So we will begin with about a cup and a half of fresh strawberries. There really is no rhyme to reason to how you're going to cut these strawberries. You just want to make sure that the bottoms are off and that they're cut into very small bits because we're going to end up crushing them with a potato masher. If you have kids at home or if you have nieces and nephews or grandkids that like to come over, they really enjoy the smash part. It goes over really well. I tend to cut mine in half first just because it gives you the option of then cutting the strawberry in fourths after that and that makes much smaller pieces. And once they've been cut the long way, just bunch them up and then just cut very small pieces. All right, that's about all of them. And you want to put them over in a deep bowl because if you put them on a flat pan or if you put them in a shallow bowl, sometimes the juices, depending on how juicy the strawberry, will bounce back at you. So you want to start to press firmly and you'll start to see the juice coming out in the bottom of the pan. All right. They don't have to be completely pureed because some of the best parts of the jam are the strawberry chunks. At this point, we will take four cups of granulated sugar and pour it into our strawberry mash. And then we will mix it with our strawberries. You're going to get a nice, pretty pink color. At this point, we will let the strawberries and the sugar sit for about five minutes, but this will give you some time to grab a pot, some mason jars, and your dry pectin for the next step of the recipe. All right, well, it's been about five minutes, and now our strawberries have pureed just a little bit, but we still have some chunks. So what we're going to do now is create the jam mixer. We will start with three fourth cups of water and 1.75 ounces of dry pectin. We will stir this just a little bit and eventually it's going to form something like a jelly, but we don't want to make it too thick because we still have to add our strawberries to this mixture. Let me tell you, dry pectin is not one of those things that you find in the seasoning aisle or the baking aisle or the anywhere aisle where you think it should be. So here I am 
running around the grocery store trying to find dry pectin. I'm asking the grocery store clerk, do you know where the dry pectin is? Nobody knows. I guess nobody uses dry pectin anymore. Like it just doesn't happen. Come to find out, you can find it near the aluminum foil, even though it's made for fruit. Don't ask me. But I hear you can also find it at any hardware store in your canning section. So now you know, don't run around the grocery store like me looking like a crazy person. So we are now to the point where we can add our strawberries into the mix. There's lots of thick sugar at the bottom of this, so make sure you get it all out. And cook this over medium heat. You don't want to make it too high because you don't want to scorch the bottom of your pan. We're going to bring this to a boil. It'll cook for about three minutes or until all of the sugar crystals have dissolved. What you will notice once it starts to boil and bubble is that there might be a pink film that rises to the top and it's up to you whether you want to take it off or not. I'll show you a way to get it out very easily without having to spoon it out like my grandmother used to do. My grandmother used to skim all the foam off, but if you're just making a jam, it doesn't matter. But for jelly, you want to make sure that you're getting all the air pockets out, so it's really important for you to skim it all off the top. After we brought this to a boil and we stirred constantly, we turned it off of heat and let it sit for about three minutes. The reason we do that is because you don't want to bust your jars open as a result of the high heat. So we'll place a large mason jar inside of a deep bowl. You can use the same bowl that you used earlier to mash those strawberries because sometimes this gets a little messy putting a wide pot against a smaller jar. So go ahead and add our mixture. And sometimes you'll need a spoon just to guide it in. You want to leave about an inch at the top of the jar. Last little bits of strawberry. Awesome. And then we will close our jar. And this will need to be refrigerated for 24 hours. After the 24 hour period is completed, if you don't want to use it right away, you can stick it in the freezer and it's good for up to a year. Alright, once your lid is on tight, you can go ahead and take it out of the bowl and it's ready to be refrigerated for 24 hours and then served or frozen. Here's a jam that's actually been setting for 24 hours and it is ready to serve. Just want to show you what it looks like when it comes out. You can serve it with your favorite kind of bread or you can just eat it out of the jar. I used to do that a lot when I was little, got in trouble all the time. Don't tell anybody. And here is your fresh strawberry jam. I'm Caressa Jackson for Heart of the Home. Come and get it. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafarmbureau.org. Strawberries are grown in every state in the U.S. There are 313 strawberry farms in Virginia, almost double the number from five years ago. They are extremely popular pick-your-own crop, and growers often use them to kick off their summer season. A member of the Rose family, the strawberry plant is a perennial, meaning it will come back year after year. Most strawberry plants remain productive for about five years. The average American eats three and a half pounds of fresh strawberries every year. Stay healthy and fit. Eat five or more servings of colorful fruits and vegetables every day. Five a day, the color way. You say you've never heard of Cooperative Extension? Well, you might be surprised to hear that they've been helping Virginians for a century. Dave Miller has more. 2014 is the 100th anniversary of the Smith-Lever Act, 
when Congress established the land-grant university system to assist farmers across the nation. It's also when the title Cooperative Extension began being used for agents working with the farmers and the youth of Virginia. We had the first corn club uh, for boys from Chesterfield and Dinwiddie, a hundred students that you know worked together to learn how to grow corn more effectively. And then in uh, 2013, was the first community club in the state of Virginia was here in Dinwiddie also. So we have a lot of history with the beginnings of extension. Today's this is one of our many projects working with the farmers, uh, putting in uh, localized field plots where they can see hands-on research from our specialists from extension. And we're putting in a, a peanut variety trial today with a combination of different fungicide treatments with one of our uh, uh, specialists from the Tidewater AREC. Field research and personal instruction like this is what has made American agriculture the envy of the world. Caroline County grain and cattle farmer Alan Tigner Jr. says he's relied on the advice from extension agents for decades. Back then, particularly, uh, the land was being tilled, a lot of no-till, no uh, well, turn plowing and, and disking, and there was a lot of erosion going on. And so they helped me learn a lot about uh, how to do with less tillage and uh, even with no-till. The extension uh, helped me learn uh, new ways of marketing, uh, especially concerning the uh, learning about the grading of cattle and what the uh, buyers really wanted. I've got to wear many hats, but I have many supporters in Extension, and that's what's so good about Extension, the numerous amount of resources that we have with our specialists on campus and at the research stations that we can uh, draw their knowledge you know, back to your county level. The partnership with Extension is between the community, the local government, the local Extension office, volunteers, and the specialists. It's a large network that works as long as there is communication for the common goal to bring the latest research and knowledge from the university to the local level. You know, I feel like I'm part of the community. You know, I have farmers that I've known now for 21 years that I've been working with, and it's, it's, a, it's a definitely a relationship. I know what resources they have. They know what resources that I bring to them. Um, I, uh, I rotate who I get to volunteer. So we spread it out so the whole community feels involved uh, within the county. And it, it's a really good, a good system. You feel like you're part of a family. Farmers and our society have seen enormous change in the past century, from the horse and buggy to the internet. But Tigner believes farmers and all Virginians need extension more than ever. With the work that we have to do, actual work on the farm, it's, it's nearly impossible for us to keep up with everything uh, with this new technology that's coming on the scene. So we have to rely on them to uh, help us and teach us. I have relied on it a lot, and uh, I think uh, younger people coming on will need it as much as I did, if not uh, even more. Whether it's with youth education in 4-H or with the production side of farming, Extension has grown together with rural and urban communities over the past century. And that tradition and cooperation will continue as long as folks need a personal touch on the farm or in their homes. This is Dave Miller reporting. That's going to do it for this edition of Real Virginia. We are so glad you could join us to celebrate the bounty Virginia has to offer. Whether it's in your home, your garden, or your landscape, we're proud to say that this is Real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a good week. Chesapeake Bay.